It's my great honor, and I'm very excited to introduce everybody in our community to um, somebody who's become a friend and supporter, a fellow sister in recovery. Um, so please help me welcome Kelsey Morera. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of a bio, introduce you to people. Sure. Kind of just go from the official script. Love it. <laughs> After a journey in self-discovery and sobriety, founder Kelsey Morera renewed her love for baking and inadvertently created an, an amazing edible cookie dough recipe from scratch that can be enjoyed either raw or baked. Kelsey recently took Dope, which is the name of her company, on ABC's hit show Shark Tank, and she was named in Forbes 30 Under 30 for how quickly she's grown this business and her mission-driven mentality behind it. Kelsey's using her newfound success to reduce social stigmas around addiction and mental health, continuing to share her story in hopes of inspiring others to feel less alone. Uh, Kelsey's entire company, Dope, is built on helping others with mental illness and sobriety. So how could we not be friends with her? Um, some <laughs> months ago, some months ago, and we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of it, but um, Kelsey's team reached out to us when they learned about us and they they were very interested in asking us whether we wanted to be the recipient of their Dope for Hope campaign, which is actually what we're going to talk about a little bit later. We gratefully said yes. And now we are going to be the beneficiary of um, a percentage of all of the sales of Dope, which will help us deliver the much needed services that we are trying to deliver to women who are experiencing mental health and addiction issues, as well as a as I said earlier, a host of other issues that I talked about. Um, so I was born in Dallas, raised in Northern California. I've got a family that loves food. I grew up, you know, baking and things as a kid and whatnot. Um, my mom is a great baker and a chef. And, uh, you know, she would always ask me, you know, you can make any recipe, like pick anything. And I'm like, get the cookie book out. I just was obsessed with baking cookies, loved it as a kid. Um, when I got into high school, I got this opportunity to work at Intel and, um, kind of jumped from being in child mode to being in adult mode rather quickly. And I lost sight of a lot of my passions, including baking. And I was uh, really leaning on alcohol through the next 10 years. Um, I worked at Intel to deal with anxiety and stress. And, um, you know, it's no fault of my parents or anything, but I always had this really intense perfectionism and like weight on myself to just be everything for everybody all the time. And um, that was exhausting and it felt this kind of pull through my kind of high school years and into college years of like, I loved what I was doing at work, but I thought because of how society and Hollywood and all this sort of normalizes drinking that like I needed to also go and drink and party to be cool and to fit in and, and to find a group and it was um, I really always felt sort of split. Like I had my life in doing really well in school and, and getting, you know, straight A's and going for it. Um, and then also partying and, and the first time I drank, I drank till I blacked out and um, just always going to excess, you know, like one drink was just never going to be enough. And um, through all those years that I, that I drank from probably 14, 15, um, was the first time I went to a party freshman year. Um, uh, and then all the way until I was, I guess I was 25 when I got sober. So, um, you know, it was a, a lot of years of just, whoa, that is not who I want to be nights. You know, you wake up and you're just like, oh, what the heck happened? Then someone has to explain to you what you did. And then you're apologizing again. And, um, you know, through college, it's easy for people to be like, oh, it's just your party years. It's just your party days. You know, you'll get through it. Or yeah, that was really dumb what you did, but you know, you'll get through it. And um, once it continued happening, even out of college, um, I just, finally came to a head and, you know, realized like, what am I doing except working and drinking? You know, there was just no life that I was really grabbing onto. Um, and the final hurrah was a business trip for me. I was um, in Barcelona with Intel and it was the very first day arriving on a seven day trip. And business trips were always the worst for me. You know, it was kind of this like, let your guard down. Everybody's ready to let loose. And no one around me knows I have a problem with drinking. You know, your family's not there. My boyfriend at the time, you know, he wasn't there. Um, everyone else just thinks you're going to be, you know, the fun life of the party, Kelsey. And I always had a, a problem on, on business things. And so, um, you know, I get to the hotel, it's like 10 a.m. They're like, oh, you know, Miss Witherow at the time, like, um, 
you know, here's your welcome bottle of wine, like for you being a Marriott, whatever rewards member. And I'm like, oh, 10 a.m. Like, I mean, they gave me the wine, so it should be fine. And had the, the bottle of wine, um, half bottle of wine and went to the pool, started drinking from there. And, you know, little did I know, I you know, came to it like 3.30 in the morning. Uh, I was in a stranger's apartment in the middle of Barcelona alone. I had no phone, um, you know, had done things I absolutely would never have done had I had my wits about me and um, made it back to that hotel, you know, got into a cab somehow. And it's all, all sort of a blur, but I had just blown up so much in that moment, you know, that, that morning having to call my boyfriend of four years at the time and tell him what had happened. My relationship was over and it just all came so clear in that moment, you know, it came so clear that I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. I called my Nana. Um, it was on Skype back then. I think it was on Skype. I don't think I had FaceTime. I remember Skype. Right. I think I was Skyping her, um, you know, and, and she for many years was so worried about my drinking. She was 21 years sober when she passed away, uh, just about a year, a year and a couple months from that phone call. Um, so she had been waiting for that call for a really long time for me to say, you know, I'm ready to stop. And she said, you need to get yourself to an AA meeting and we're going to figure this out, you know? So um, I found an English speaking AA meeting that morning in Barcelona and uh, haven't had a drink of alcohol since, since that night. Um, and that's now more than five years ago. So my life, you know, has blossomed from there and I'm happy to continue, you know, chatting about that. But uh, that was kind of the moment of just enough's enough. I didn't want to wait and see would I get a DUI? You know, I'd already been arrested. I'd already been hospitalized. And it was like, when do you just draw your own line? You know, what, what's so important about alcohol that it makes these instances worth it? I wasn't going to have a relationship with myself or anyone else if I kept drinking. Well, that's incredible. You know, we talk a lot around here about the idea that we, it, we get to say when enough is enough and our enough isn't necessarily even the person besides us enough, right? Mm -hmm. And your story sounds like mine, except I didn't go to college until after I got into recovery. But just like from that very first moment of drinking, I was gone. So blackout, you know, it was ridiculous. And thank you for sharing that. That's brave. And I know that you um, so have what is your recovery pathway been like over the last five years? I was first living in Oregon because I was still working for Intel at the time. And I mean, initial days of sobriety, it was like, I was, like I said, I was on day one of a seven day business trip. I couldn't exactly tell my boss, like, look, so I've got this problem with alcohol. I need to fly home. You know, it was just like, I got to figure it out. I got to go through six more days of a business trip of conferences and this convention and everything, not drinking and go home only to when I got home, it was two days home. And I was leaving for the Philippines for a two week volunteer trip with Intel. So it was like, it was the start of just this crazy expanse of travel and this and my life, you know, my relationship was blown up. We had to move apartments. Um, we were already moving together to one apartment and had to, you know, change plans. And, and when I got back from that trip, you know, half my stuff was left in boxes in the apartment. He had taken his half and was gone. And I had to literally pick up the pieces of my life and then get on a plane a couple of days later to go to the Philippines, which um, in itself was a great chance to sort of like think about other people's problems, you know, that like puts yourself in perspective of like, you know, what really matters in life. And, you know, we were um, helping a village that had been devastated by a typhoon and bringing technology back to them. So, yeah, it was kind of this like, I would have loved to just, you know, go into, um, you know, so we're living community or something and just been like, I'm going to meditate for 12 hours a day, but I had to keep going, you know, life just kept happening. Um, when I got back from that trip though, I was, uh, you know, sticking with AA in the beginning, I went to, um, a 6am meeting in Oregon, Hillsborough, Oregon. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I am the only person this age that has this problem, you know, like everyone else can get it together what is wrong with me? You know, I just really, I had a, lo a long, hard road to accepting that, like, this does happen to other people my age. And that's one thing I love about you guys is like, it's such an open community of people of all walks of life at all stages of their life, um, coming to terms with whatever they, they need in recovery. I really could have benefited from this in the early days, which is why I'm so excited to help amplify it. Um, I met amazing people in those meetings and whatnot. And it was a great sort of like, um, a place to get an example of what could be because I did have some people in those rooms that were like, you know, I was your age when I stopped drinking and now I'm, you know, I think he was 35 at the time and I'm married and I've got kids and look how happy my life has become. So like stick with it, you know, you can do it. 
And uh, those were really great examples to see in the beginning to know that like this could be ahead for me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it started to blossom from there. I think through my recovery, I really leaned on um, just channeling my energy into more positive stuff. And I was back in the kitchen baking every night, every weekend, you know, outside of Intel. I, I really found my peace. It was like meditating, you know, baking is such precision. You have to like weigh and measure. And, you know, I'm the one that's like takes to level off the cup measure and stuff. So um, it's really calming for me to just follow the set of instructions, measure everything out and, and make something great. And then the joy of like someone else gets to try it and they light up or they have some memory evoked from what they're eating. And, you know, I just, I love that. So um, yeah, that was, that was a really special place for me. I just lived in the kitchen. <laughs> And so your first year sounds like you were really exploring all sorts of different modalities and returning to your love of baking. So many of us return to things from our younger years or from our childhood to find the comfort when we're when we're no longer using those unhealthy behaviors or or those substances kind of to cope with with anxiety or perfectionism or any of those things. Can you tell me a little bit about your Nana? Because I just that kind of really touched my heart to hear that she had been sober and I can only imagine yeah. As, as somebody who, as a mother to my own daughter, Taryn, you know, when she finally kind of made the decision that it was enough, it was enough. Um, it's a pretty, yeah. pretty spectacular moment for her. And I imagine for you as well to have had her support you. She, uh, yeah. So she was 21 years sober when she passed away. And when she 21 years prior made the decision to stop drinking, um, you know, and it was kind of a, you never saw Nana without a glass in her hand. Um, I was of course quite young then, you know, I think but four or five years old when she decided to stop drinking. Um, but for my dad, having watched her all those years and whatnot, and of course my papa, her husband um, of I think like 55 years or 60 or something. So, um, you know, they had a long road together with the trouble that alcohol had caused for the family and, and caused on her body, you know, between that and smoking, um, you know, it really took a toll on her physical health. But um, there's like a running joke that she took a roadie in the car on the way to rehab those years back, you know, or one last hurrah and um, went into rehab and man, she just stuck with that, you know, just, I don't know if it's in our genes or something to just say, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to really, really do it. And, um, you know, she had a great life continue to blossom from there and was an absolute anchor for our family. Um, she and I baked quite a lot together as well. And especially in like the last year of her life. Um, you know, we were constantly baking. I've got great memories of like accidentally turning on the mixer too fast with powdered sugar in there. It explodes in a giant plume in her kitchen. And she's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm making a mess in my kitchen. But no, we had a blast. We got to bond so much over those years. Um, she really was my best friend. And, um, you know, many days uh, being able to share what had happened even that first year with her were just so rewarding to show her like, look, I, I started a small bakery when I was in Oregon. And, you know, she was just overjoyed that I had created something like this and you know she's ordering on our little website back then for me to ship her cupcakes to Texas and um you know telling everybody she knew about what we were doing and, and stuff so it just it would have absolutely blown her away that I made it on Shark Tank that I Forbes 30 under 30 that I created dope and all this but I mean it's like she knew it was all possible you know she got to pass away knowing all this was going to be possible for me and so much happiness was going to come um, she wrote like a final letter and uh, sort of divvied up, you know, her jewelry amongst the girl cousins and, and daughter-in-laws. And she gave me this diamond heart necklace that my papa had given her for her first year of sobriety. Um, I also have like her first chip and whatnot, but yeah, that necklace is so special to me. Um, it was my one year, you know, just shortly before, um, mm. before she passed. So yeah, wow, she was a really special lady. We miss her dearly. Oh, that's so beautiful, Kelsey. Oh my gosh. And I don't know why I put mascara on today, but um, <laughs> waterproof is the trick. <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful story of intergenerational healing, right? Yeah. And, you know, just having, you know, you called her, it's, it's the fact that she was there and, and she was there and, in a moment in your life where you needed somebody who was where she was at and had been where you were. So yeah, uh, I think had a really special relationship. It was so nice. And that's really beautiful. When she passed, it was, um, you know, this gut thing, it was like the day after Thanksgiving and we got a call that she was going into hospice and, you know, she died from lung cancer. So it's the slow progression of things are getting worse. We had kind of each gone out and spent a couple of weeks with her and whatnot, but, um, in the, you know, final, Hey, she's going into hospice. I was like, I'm getting on a plane. I got to get there. And I made it there like 
maybe 8 p.m., um, spent the night like laying in the bed beside her, you know, holding her hand and she couldn't speak at that time. Um, we called my dad in the morning, like, are you guys close? Are you flying in? And it's just me and her and um, a family friend, Morgan, in the room. And she spoke to my dad, on, well, he spoke to her on the phone, on speakerphone, you know, and said, mom, if you can wait, wait for me, we're on our way. Uh, but if you can't, you know, be at peace and and go if you need to. And she passed away 15 minutes later while I held her hand. So, um, yeah, she just moved everybody that she touched. And uh, I somehow got out, you know, a speech at her celebration of life without completely bursting into tears. But yeah, she's with us every day for wow. sure. Well, she's touched us too. What's her name? We like to say the names of the women who came before us. Yes, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Witherow. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, that's really special. You know, and I, I can say as somebody who uh, was with my mom at the very end of her life, tw just about 21 years ago, it's it's a special moment in my recovery and in my life. And I, yeah. knowing that I couldn't have been there in that way without my recovery just means that my recovery just meant so much more to me in that moment. So, yeah, yeah. Really it was like one of the first really intensely emotional things I had to go through sober, you know, that just guttural pain that they're gone there, I've never had anyone close to me pass away. So that was my first time even experiencing death at any close degree and um, not being able to go get a drink and numb it, you know, like some family members did, you know, some, um, some family members do lean on alcohol and just have to can't handle it, you know, get a tap out here. Thank you very much. And when you're sober, you go through it, you know, you really yeah. live it and feel it and process it. So it's like, it's the hardest, but the healthiest way to like go through anything challenging in your life. Absolutely. And I think in, with grief and with loss like that, sometimes it's people really do depend on the substances to get them through it. But even outside of that, it's just so much part of the tradition of, you know, yeah. that, that's what you do, you know, the Irish way and all that type of thing. So yeah, well, like that, that was a lot to land on your plate in your first year. Yeah, yeah, celebrating stuff or something goes wrong and everybody leans to, oh, man, you've had a hard week, you deserve a glass of wine or man, you got to celebrate, let's go out and get some drinks and, you know, I'm just on a master mission to change that up in society, you know, and make it where you go get a cup of cookie dough to celebrate instead. <laughs> So, Unless you have an eating disorder, in which case you may not want to do that, but there's all sorts of different options, right? So for yeah. sure, we recognize that. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, I've, my granddaughter and I did have baked two types of the cookie dough now. <laughs> I'm waiting for her to come back so we can do the next two. And again, just that, I mean, my daughters will tell you, my best friend taught them how to bake. I couldn't bake my way out of anything. <laughs> I'm just not a baker. I'm not, I'm just not a baker. Yeah. So um so you know, to be able to work with my granddaughter and actually we just used a melon scooper and scooped it out and put it in it just Love it. But still it was really special Use your finger <laughs> yes it was no, special awesome. it was it was the the tradition you know having the tradition of she might remember one day that we used to bake cookies and she doesn't know that cookies don't come already prepared and go on a cookie tin yeah um, I think her mom bakes with her too using flour and all those yeah. basic ingredients but <laughs> so, so awesome. tell me more about your first year or so like what what happened what what happened to intel yeah so i got the opportunity about six months after getting sober it was gonna be july of 2016 to move to san francisco within intel i had been on a mission to try and get down there you know there's just so much buzz in san francisco everybody's going after their dreams and you know this entrepreneurial spirit was always really interesting to me i didn't have any entrepreneurs in my family but i just thought you know, every time I visited there, if you're sitting in any coffee shop, you're just hearing this buzz of people who think what they're working on is going to change the world, you know, and I'm like, I got to get down there. So found a new job um, inside of Intel and I was going to be running a program to fight online harassment with machine learning, uh, which was a really unique thing. I mean, I'd been in product marketing all these years uh, and I got this chance to be the program manager of something working with Lady Gaga's nonprofit, um, the Born This Way Foundation. So really neat application of everything, but moreover just got me thinking about how a company can give back, you know, how you can build something that can make money and sure it's a, you know, for-profit entity and whatnot, but what can you do with not only the finances that you're creating, but the reach that you have and this sort of like platform you're given to speak about what you care about. Um, when I moved to SF, I decided to kind of try and cut everything out. I cut coffee out for a bit. I tried being vegan. I was like, let's put my hand in everything and see how I feel, you know, I'm in this like cleansing mode or whatever. Um, and part, you know, San Francisco is just like, it's being vegan is like infectious, you know, everyone else is doing it. So you got to try it. 
but I loved butter way too much. I was still baking with butter and leaving the eggs out. And so my cookie dough recipes, which I was still baking nights and weekends, um, were now safe to eat raw. And um, so I'm, I'm down in SF and I have my sabbatical coming up with Intel and um, it's going to be 10 weeks off paid for all the years that I've worked there. Uh, they give you this, you know, sort of extended vacation to say thanks. And most people travel the world, you know, and go around. But man, I was just like in the happiest zone in recovery and sobriety. It was a new geographical location for me. So all new friends that now were meeting me for the first time as just me. And I never had to embarrass myself unless I was doing it voluntarily. So it was really awesome to have people that just knew who Kelsey was. Um, I was, you know, doing yoga all the time and just really like just figuring out what made me happy. Oh, I tried a ton of stuff in the first year too. I was like painting, uh, clay work. I tried planting. I'm a terrible gardener. <laughs> so all my plants always die. Um, but yeah, just kind of this like exploratory year of what, what do I love? And, you know, the cookie dough, um, idea really stood out to me and I decided to use that 10 week sabbatical to try my entrepreneurial wits and start a cookie dough company. So that very first day of sabbatical, I had made a hundred pounds of cookie dough at this commercial kitchen in Oakland carted it all back over to San Francisco and went out to a park in SF um, on April 20th, 2017. And we sold out of like a hundred pounds in three hours. So I'm like, whoa, okay, this dope thing, this could be something um, I got to pursue it. And I spent the next 10 weeks, you know, just building up a catering business and a little bit of wholesale, you know, and just all the learning, you know, someone's like, oh, I love your product. Like, can you send me your wholesale pricing? And I'm like, yes, of course, wholesale pricing. Absolutely. Give me 10 minutes. I'll shoot it over to you. You know, and I'm like how to formulate wholesale pricing. So I just was in it and loving it and figuring it out and kept getting so much joy from all the time and energy that I had not drinking and not being hungover anymore. I could just pour myself into something great and like into creating something um, positive for the world. So yeah, dope was kind of born from there in San Francisco. So what happened after the 10 weeks and you had to go back to work? I didn't go back to work. You didn't? <laughs> yes, okay, exactly. so that was it. That was it. I, at the end of the 10 weeks, I was like, I had an event like every day for seven days in a row and I had worked them all myself. So I was finally like, I need to get some employees. You know, I need to be able to still do business development to like keep getting events planned. And I'm supposed to go to the office on, I think it was like a Thursday or something. And I had to call my boss and be like, I'm so sorry. Like I have two events on Thursday. Like I can't come down. I'm going to need to put in my two weeks notice and I'll, I'll bring in my laptop and whatnot. Um, I'm going to pursue this cookie dough thing. And I think everyone thought I was insane, you know, like my, my parents won't really say it, but I feel like when I first told them, they were thinking, what is going on? She's having a quarter life crisis. You know, she's going to quit her safe career and go open a cookie dough store, um, whatever that will look like, you know, because in the beginning I was just catering and um, it was my two year sobriety anniversary that we were opening up our first like physical location, a kiosk on Market Street. Um, and so, yeah, it, at the time of quitting my job, it was still very fluid. You know, I think we'd probably done like $15,000 in sales or something at that point, you know, so it was, a, it was great for like, Hey, your first 10 weeks of something, but it was also like, are you sure forever? And you're going to drop this safe salary and, you know, um, a little uncertain, but yeah. Well, and, and then, so then you're like, not only changing careers, but you're moving into like moved into like that the food and beverage industry, yeah. which for somebody who is still two years into recovery, like that's a whole new challenge. Was it not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think in the beginning too, and in San Francisco, so that, that kiosk that I'm talking about was sort of my first exposure to this. Cause there was kind of a tight knit network of the other owners. It was in a food hall. So there were other operators, um, within one place fun story before I get into that side of it is um, because the grand opening was on our two year sobriety anniversary, I had put on the Facebook event, if you come up and say it's dope to be sober, you'll get 20% off. And um, the response that we got from people was like insane, you know, getting all these messages, like personal messages of people saying, hey, like, this is so cool. I'm two weeks sober. Do you know of any, um, you know, good meetups in the city or uh, someone, you know, I'm 13 years sober and I've never told anyone. It's really amazing to see you sharing this and like, just really like moving messages to get as just a, you know, a proprietor of cookie dough here on Instagram. You know, I just, I didn't feel like, whoa, is there's such a need for this conversation 
which is otherwise probably feeling so shrouded for people. They're feeling like it's a shameful point. They can't bring it up or they don't know anybody that's in the same situation. So this little beacon from a cookie dough company to say, hey, me too, was like an open door. And I thought, we got to do something about this. So I formed the Dope for Hope, Initi uh, Dope for Hope initiative um, right at that point and kind of formulated all the, all the give back and good that we would try and do with the company around mental health and um, addiction recovery, uh, given my journey. So that was my first soiree into Dope for Hope, which was a really fun kind of like origin story of it. Um, no kidding. I love it. Yeah. Um, but in that kiosk, uh, you know, in the food hall, it was like, you know, right into it. It was exhausting to the hours that you're working and you don't have enough money for all the staff for, you know, to be supporting all these different angles. So I was still, I was still working a lot of events. I was hauling, you know, equipment up and down this little 1904 elevator in San Francisco, you know, and like battered and bruised head to toe. Like they used to call me the mini Hulk. Cause I'd always be like lifting all this equipment back and forth um, from like a lift, you know, or an Uber out front to, to go to these events. Um, and so that stress really starts to build and you don't have the time that I had before when I was working Intel to go to yoga as much as I want or stop and write in my journal at night. Cause I got home at 10 and I was beat, you know, and I smelled like cookie dough from my hair <laughs> alone. So you're just exhausted. And I wasn't doing those things that I knew would keep me in check and keep me in, in line. And so, um, lots of drinking, of course, going on, there was like a brewery bar kind of thing in the kiosk and whatnot. And I was, you know, fortunate enough, I, you know, thank my lucky stars every day that I made the decision every single day to stay away from alcohol, but the um, smoke breaks, you know, them stepping outside to smoke some cigarettes and whatnot and cut the stress. And I started smoking for, it lasted for probably six months to a year of like kind of off and on having a cigarette here and there. And it was just, it was so not me. It was like, what am I doing? I'm just replacing, you know, one thing with another. This is now my easy out. If I'm stressed, I step outside and have a, have a cigarette. So, um, I was able to, you know, cut that out, but that food and beverage industry you talk about, you know, with just the lifestyle of everybody else is also grinding and exhausted and they're all having a couple shots at the bar and you have to be really strong to say, no, I'm good. I actually don't drink. Um, and it took me, I think about six months to a year of sobriety before I was really like, no, I don't drink because I had a problem with alcohol. And, you know, before that I was like, oh, I'm training for a half marathon, you know, I'm just laying off it for right now. Like, you know, whatever you need to say to make it, make the questions kind of stop. And, and sometimes they didn't, you know, my first um, music festival that I went to sober, it was like, they're passing around the camelback of vodka and they're like, come on, come on. I'm like, I really, I really don't drink. I know it sounds funny, but like, I just don't. And you have to be so strong inside that you've made this decision, know why you've made it and be able to look a peer in the face with peer pressure of your mid twenties and say, I'm good. You know, I'm not going to have it. Thank you so much though. Um, so yeah. much more difficult. I do think for younger, for younger people, you know, yeah. I, I so kudos to you. Like I, I, I know I witnessed over the last three decades watching other young women in recovery, how hard that can be just to try to stand yeah. out above the crowd. But, um, you know, do you have, do you, so still today, what are the, what do you think some of the challenges are for you in your, in your recovery and your sobriety today? Do you have any, or do you feel like, where, yeah. where do you, where do you have to be careful? Not, and I don't mean in terms of um, returning to alcohol, but like if I'm a workaholic, so you sound like you're pretty busy too. So are there other areas of your life that you need to kind of focus on as part of your overall recovery journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think it's gotten easier on the alcohol side, as you mentioned, once you start to get out of that party stage, you know, my husband and I moved to the suburbs of Las Vegas, where, you know, it's just us at the cats in the house, and, you know, he also doesn't really drink. So you're not as constantly berated with the, you know, onslaught of someone else is going to have a drink, are you going to too? So it's gotten easier um, from that regard, but certainly just life challenges of, you know, running this business has been immensely stressful, you know, immensely. And I am also a workaholic. I, I really struggle finding the balance. Um, my dad says it every time, you know, I get a text from him pretty much every other day. He's probably watching right now and he'll text me, find the balance. He's like, what are you doing to find the balance today? He just has seen me put the blinders on and just go all in. And it's just all work all the time. And, you know, how are you still taking care of yourself? And he'll be like, how's your husband? Have you checked on your cats today? Do they have food? You know, like you gotta be, um, you really need those. Like I, I need those support systems. Like, you know, my dad, my mom, 
as well to be checking in with me and saying, you know, are you doing what you need to do to try and, um, you know, keep things level? Cause it is so easy. I don't know if it's just a personality trait that, that I've got where I just really throw myself into whatever I'm working on. And I feel very emotionally connected to the success or failure of the business as well. Um, when we've had ups and we've had downs, it's like this very like visceral emotional roller coaster. You know, the highs are so high. I mean, it really, we had a great call last Tuesday, this partner we're working on something with. And I mean, I, I literally felt high, like the adrenaline is just flying. And then, you know, it just takes like a day later and, oh, our Facebook ad account's not working so well, something's going wrong. And I'm like, it, it's like hard to not go into an actual depression, you know, or challenges we had last year, we had some um, legal battles we were in and man, I mean, you go through this stuff and you're just like, I was having panic attacks like every couple of months um, through the summer of last year, uh, just losing it. And um, it just takes this constant pullback to say, okay, I know what I got to do. I got to get back on my routine. You know, I did my yoga this morning. I meditated. When am I going to write my journal next? And just keep your, keep your checklist of like, what are those things that keep you back on the ground? And um, yeah, try and like ride through these waves, like a little more even keeled. Okay. So a couple of those high points must have been, although I imagine they came with some stress as well, was being on Shark Tank and the Forbes 30 under 30. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, those were, I mean, particularly for both the moment that you hear you're, you've been chosen, you know, that you're going to be on it. And it's like 0.002% chance that you make it on Shark Tank. I don't even know what the odds are for Forbes 30 under 30, but the, um, the Shark Tank selection was just like, whoa, like, I can't believe it. I sat on a curb for an open casting call. You know, I wasn't, I don't know anybody at Shark Tank. I didn't get a, a favor called in. I went and I just pitched my little heart out and, and they chose me to be on the show. So um, immensely joyful in that time. It was very stressful leading up to filming and whatnot. And then going out to film, you know, I'm a solo founder. So I had to put myself out there alone, you know, and I'm standing there before the doors are going to open for filming and they're counting down from like a hundred. It feels like off stage and I'm by myself and I'm like, I am going to pee my pants. Like this is going to happen. I've, I literally will tell you this. I have never felt like I'm just going to do it. And I don't know how to stop it because that nerve, it's like your stomach is like in a full knot. You're so nervous. And then they open the doors and I walk down and I hit my mark and I was like, I've prepared my whole life for this. It's like the day before my three year sobriety anniversary, let's freaking crush it. And I just like nailed my pitch. I, I really was so proud of myself in the tank for knowing my numbers. I had flashcarded everything like crazy. And um, yeah, I mean, my Nana was standing beside me, you know, for that I'm sure. Cause I really just felt so at peace through it. And I was able to like have some, you know negative commentary, like they were like, oh, it's, you know not a product that's healthy or whatnot. And I'm like, dessert but I you know held it like really calm and collected through it and then when it ends I turn around and I'm walking out and I smile and I click my heels and you know say I hope to see you guys soon or something and and as soon as I turn my back to them I lost it like emotional dive I just was in hysterics like hyperventilating full sobs I'm like I, I don't even think at the time because I was just so destroyed that I was realizing, oh my God, this could be on national television, you know, like, of course they're going to air this girl in hysterics crying. I was trying to hide from the cameraman around the producer so that they would stop filming me because they were filming so close to my face. Um, and it was, it was just a real emotional moment of like what I just worked so hard for. I didn't get a deal in the tank and it didn't end like I thought it would. And just cliff, you know, just off the cliff. I was like, I, it was this dive of emotions and, um, you know, they didn't end up airing that on the show. And I just so thank the producers. If they ever watch one of these <laughs> interviews where I share the story, I'd really thank them for not, uh, not showing that, but I was like fully prepared for how we we're going to talk about this, that it's okay to feel your feelings. And, you know, that was a real show of someone just going through raw emotions of working so hard for something. And, um, yeah, and they didn't end up airing it, but it was an emotional roller coaster. I, I took a mental health day the next day from work. Kind of a lost opportunity in a sense for them not to have aired it, right? To show how, how, and I just think it says so much about how intensely entrepreneurs feel about their thing, right? So and it's, um, yeah, you know, entrepreneurship is not for the, is not for everybody. It's, not for the you know, part, there's yeah. so much riding on it. 
Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Yeah, we do mental health days in our company. So you can take a day off when you need one, no questions asked. And um, I wrote the staff, you know, that afternoon, I was like, I'll be taking a mental health day tomorrow. Like I might need another one the next day. It was very intense. And you wait, you know, it was another six months from there until I realized it would actually air. So you just went through this, you didn't get the deal. And you don't know if your episode will actually make it on TV. And if it doesn't, you can never talk about it publicly. Yeah. So it was a, it was a roller coaster, but another, wow, I made it through that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, no drinking okay. to celebrate, no drinking when you're sad. <laughs> and what about the Forbes list? How did that come about? Yeah. So, um, Forbes 30 under 30, I had applied the year prior for it. Um, so this would have been like for 2019 list and I didn't get it. And they had said, you know, let's keep an eye on you, you know, let us know what you're up to. Um, want to watch you grow a little bit more. And so the next year, re-emailed them, you know, here's the big list of all the stuff we've been doing and a lot about Dope for Hope, you know, the work we've been doing in that area, um, impact we're having and uh, having aired on Shark Tank and whatnot. And so um, it was, I think like December 10th or something of 2019 that they were announcing that um, to the uh, honorees or, or whatnot that they had been chosen for 2020. Um, and I was at the gym, it was like five in the morning or something, cause it was getting sent out Eastern time. <laughs> so it was like five in the morning and I'm, I shouldn't have done this cause I try to not check my email before I'm at my desk, but I'm scanning my email, you know, waiting for my husband to come out from the locker room. And I see this, like you've been selected for Forbes 30 under 30. And I'm like, I'm going to be crying in a gym, you know, <laughs> and I just, yeah, I had a quick, had a quick tear and he came out and was just like, so elated. It was such an honor. And, um, I'm turning 30 in like a week and a half or something like that. So it was cool. I fit that in right before the, the finish line here. <laughs> oh, so well-deserving. And, and Kelsey, your, your authenticity and your, just your realness is, I think um, I, you're just a bright light. I, I just, I'm, I think that I'm just so drawn to your energy and I know that everybody else who's watching will be as well. Tell us more about Dope for Hope, um, just kind of the history of it. And then we can yeah. talk specifically about what it means for She Recovers um, at this moment in time. Yeah, so Dope for Hope was kind of my effort to make initiatives at the company all align around, you know, one purpose. And that was really to break the stigma around mental health and addiction recovery, um, make people feel less alone with what they're going through and um, to provide, you know, resources and support where we can um, on the topic. So we have a Dope for Hope pledge on our website that people can sign. It's like, you know, you'll be there for a friend when they need you and you'll reach out for help when you need it. Um, just kind of an encouraging thing to sign and share. We do mental health Mondays as well on our Instagram, um, sharing out the content and kind of a little dose of hope on a Monday morning on your Instagram feed. Um, and then mental health days, like I mentioned inside the company and also my work outside the company, sharing my story, um, you know, as broadly as I can podcasts and whatnot, just to keep getting this message out there that, you know, it does, people do stop drinking in their mid twenties and awesome stuff can be ahead in recovery. So, um, the, the biggest, most awesome thing I think is the work that we do, like is gonna be with She Recovers here to donate a portion of every sale um, to a nonprofit that works in this area. So we historically in like 2018 and 2019 had done one flavor where all of the profits from that flavor were, were being donated. Um, and now uh, we've moved it into being for every single sale across the company, you know, wholesale, uh, e-commerce, anything that we do that sells a cookie dough bite to anybody, um, we donate 1% uh, of that to a nonprofit. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a real honor to be able to do that. And last year we donated more than $20,000. So I'm very excited to see what we can do this year um, for She Recovers being our beneficiary for 2021. I just know there's going to be awesome stuff ahead. You guys are so aligned to how mm -hmm. I view recovery and my philosophy around there's not one path forward, but I genuinely think who you're surrounded with while you're in recovery and the conversations you engage in and the people you engage with will define, you know, your best step at, at having another day in recovery. So um, I'm really grateful that you guys exist and that I found you. I was like, Taryn, I think we're like soul sisters. <laughs> like we need to connect. <laughs> so incredible. And we're, we're just so grateful to you, you know, and like you are just, we have 10 intentions of guiding principles, as you know, and you just you kind of exemplify each and every one of them. And, um, you know, especially the, the one when we're ready, we recover out loud so that women who are struggling can find and join our movement. And I just love that, you know, our message is gonna be amplified by, by your attention to this issue, you know, mental health and, and, and addiction. 
Um, so what our what our wonderful executive director Susan Carter has said is the contributions made through the sale of dope products will provide critically needed funds to fuel our efforts of shattering the barriers that keep women from seeking help when struggling with mental health issues and addiction. Kelsey and her team continue to lead the way using commerce as a catalyst for social change. And we are so, so proud to be the beneficiary of Dope for Hope. Um, you know, what, what we're really, really passionate about doing is providing free resources to women in or seeking recovery. And as just because we provide free resources doesn't mean that it's free for us to do the work that we do. In fact, you know, yeah. the opposite is absolutely mm -hmm. true. So um, we're just, just to have somebody like you, uh, your caliber of recovery, your passion for recovery, and um, you know, you, you're walking the talk, you're walking the talk, not only in your personal recovery, but as an organization that really is doing what we, we all need to do, right, which is stamp out the stigma associated with not just with addiction, but also with recovery. You know, we need yeah. people to be proud. Kelsey, thank you so much, not just for this um, Mental Health Monday session, but for, for being such a, an incredible partner. And we're really excited to see what we can do to better benefit women, not just in our community, but women who have yet to find either of our communities. So thank you. Um, anybody who's listening, please do follow DOPE. It's D-O-U-G-H-P. Um, let's get that Instagram account up to 50K for them. Over the next <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> and cool. also on, you're on Facebook, your website, and um, we have a partnership page. So you can learn more about our partnership on our if you look under about us, the first tab is partnerships, partners. So you'll learn more about that. And as I said, we've got um, our executive director coming up on dope Instagram at 12:30 Pacific today, 3:30 Eastern. Taryn's going to be doing um, mindfulness moment on it's going to be longer than a moment on <laughs> Wednesday at one. And I'll be talking with Kelsey on the dope Instagram account. Um, on Friday at 11. So looking forward to the rest of this week. We've got um, a wonderful press release going out. And again, we are just so grateful. You are very first partner, you know, who's, who's going to be doing what you're doing, which is so generous and giving us a percentage of your proceeds of your sales, all sales. That's just incredible. And, you know, we need, we need partners like you in order to continue to do the work that we do. Um, so just delighted. I can't wait to hug you in person. <laughs> so awesome. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. And for anybody else who's new to our community, please do join us on uh, www.sherecovers.org. We have a private Facebook group, She Recovers Together, and we um, gather in there 24-7. We also host on, on Zoom, but on a different link if you've joined us by webinar. Um, we host two meetings a day at 9 a.m., and 5 p.m. Pacific, which is also noon Eastern or 8 Eastern, 8 p.m. We have um, our meetings are all hosted by professional recovery coaches. They're all topic focused and you are welcome there regardless of what you're in recovery from, how long you've been in recovery, how you do recovery. Uh, we just wanna support you exactly where you're at. Come along, feel free to leave your video off. You don't have to share, you won't be asked to share. It's just a really great place to start exploring what recovery might look like for you.